Mm. Okay, alrighty. Testing, testing, testing. One, two, three. Testing. Hello, friends. My name is Lucas Mann, and I'm one of the pastors of Poplar Springs Baptist Church here in Ware Shoals, Poplar Springs Baptist Church. And we come out here this afternoon with the uh, sole intent, the sole purpose of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with you, the, the good news of the gospel of the Son of God, my friends. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, and that is the good news. My friends, the Bible presents to us, it brings to our attention a, a series of, uh, of bad news, bad truths, we could say. Truths concerning our sin before God, concerning our breaking of His law, Truth concerning the fact that God is a holy God and His wrath is revealed from heaven against the wicked. But the gospel comes and addresses that great dilemma, that great problem. That we are sinners in the hands of an angry God. That we deserve hell. The gospel addresses that because it says God sent His Son. He sent His only begotten Son, the Lord Christ, the Jesus Christ, the King of glory, to die for sinners to bear in His own body the wrath that is due to us, that is due to us, that we deserve to take upon ourselves in hell. The Gospel says that Christ came to save sinners and that He did that very thing through His atoning death upon the cross. And not only that, but that He rose from the dead, that He is seated at the right hand of God in heaven, and that all who come to Jesus Christ, all who come to the Son of God, are saved from their sins, they are saved from their sins. They are saved from the power of sin in their own lives. And they are saved from their very effect of sin. That is ultimately to bring the soul to eternal destruction. And they are given a ticket to heaven, as it were. The golden ticket to heaven, we could say. They are given a placement in the kingdom of God. They are given the right to become children of God. All freely of His grace. See, my friends, salvation from sin is not something that is earned by religious duty. Salvation from sin is something that you do not attain through going to church or through reading your Bible or through prayers. All things which are good, they're all good things, but they do not bring one person, they do not bring anyone into a right standing with God. It is merely the, the work of Jesus Christ. It is merely the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The apostles preached this, the prophets even. The prophets in the Old Testament scriptures preached that salvation was freely of grace, that it is of God's work and not man's. And that is merely because God is jealous for His glory. God is jealous for His glory. God spoke through the prophet Ezekiel to the Israelites and said that He would bring about the coming of the new covenant, that He would bring about the coming of the Messiah to save His people from their sins for His own name's sake. God does these things for His own name's sake. See, we, we are born with, a, with an, in, an innate bent, as it were, to look at the world, to look at our lives in a selfish way, to look at the universe, to look at all existence as a selfish a construct, as it were. Talking, uh, we think of it as we are the center of our own existence and we are concerned with our own desires and lusts. But my friends, I tell you this, this world was created for God and for God's glory. And you and I were made in the image of God to give God glory. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. We are made to give God the glory. Give God the glory, dear friends, for the great things that He has done in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is a gracious Lord. Many of you are steeped in sin. Many of you are pornography addicts. Many of you are druggards and drunkards. Many of you are, are engaged in sexual immorality and adultery and fornication. And you're going to go to hell for those sins if you do not repent. But my friends, I tell you, Jesus Christ will graciously receive you. Jesus Christ will graciously give you eternal life if you embrace Him, if you come to Him on His terms. See, my friends, God does not uh, invite us, as it were, to come unto Himself on our own terms, on our own, um, our own basis, as it were, according to the way that we would like God to be. And we would like salvation to be. Rather, God commands and God calls us to come to us on the, on the terms that Jesus Christ, His very Son, set in place. And that was to deny yourself and to take up your cross daily 
and come after Jesus Christ. My friends, to be a follower of Christ will cost you everything. It will cost you everything. There are many preachers, unfortunately, who preach a, a, a type of discipleship, a type of following after Christ that costs you nothing, that doesn't cost you your life, that doesn't cost you your friends and your family members, that doesn't cost you your finances and all your possessions and all your dreams and aspirations. My friends, Jesus Christ owns it all. Jesus Christ is Lord of all. He already is Lord. You don't make Him Lord. You don't make Him King. You rather recognize that He is Lord and He is King over all things. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 11, 36, he said, For from Him and to Him and through Him are all things. God owns this very universe. He owns your life. God owns you. God made you. God owns everything. There is not a single maverick molecule, molecule in the universe. There is not a single person who is sovereign over their own life. And we, we must... It will bring you to hell, ma'am. You must come to Jesus Christ to be saved from your pornography. To be saved from your sins. It brings you pleasure for a moment, maybe. The Bible says that it brings pleasure for a moment. But it will earn an eternity. It will bring upon you an eternity of ruin and destruction. Jesus described hell as a place of torment. A place of outer darkness. A place where the flame is not quenched. The fires of hell are not quenched. Dear friends, Jesus Christ is a gracious Redeemer. Jesus Christ is a loving Lord. I can testify to this. I say in the words of the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost. I am not someone who is better than you objectively in the sight of God. I'm not someone who's more righteous, my friends. I'm just as much as a sinner as you are. I'm just as much as a, of an unrighteous person as you are. But my friends, the difference between you and I is that Jesus Christ has saved me from my sins. He saved me from the hell that I deserve. And He can do the same for you. Because I'm worse than you. I am the chieftain of sinners. So come. Come unto the Son of God. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, He said, Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble and hard, and you will find rest for your souls. Come before it is too late, because Jesus did say, Jesus Himself said, that He will come quickly. Uh, the, the very last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, clearly portrays the, the second coming of Christ in a way that we ought to be fearful. You ought to fear, because when Jesus Christ comes, He will not come in grace. He will not come in mercy as He did in His first advent. Jesus will come bringing wrath. Jesus will come to bring destruction. Jesus will come to obliterate the enemies of God. And if on that day you stand before God with your sin, clothed in the shadow of your iniquity, clothed in your filth, what will God say to you? Will you be found wanting? Yes. But my friends, Jesus Christ provides a garment of righteousness to sinners. See, Jesus didn't come to save the proud and the self-righteous. Jesus didn't come to save those who are in love with their sin. Jesus came to save those who recognized, I am a sinner and God is holy. God dwells in light that is unapproachable. It says in the Psalms, God hates those who do iniquity. Jesus Christ came to save those who realize and recognize that and that they are the people. They are the people who deserve God's judgment. Jesus Christ came to save those people. So dear friends, our invitation, our plea for you, our plea for you is for your soul. Don't lose your soul for your sins. Don't lose your soul over the pleasures of this life. Don't lose your soul over these vain pursuits that you've engaged yourself in. Because it's merely a drop of pleasure and you'll have to bathe and drink upon yourself a sea of wrath for all eternity. My friends, do not do this to yourself. Don't destroy yourself with your sin. Jesus Christ through His Word says, Come! Jesus Christ bore the wrath of God 
for the sins of God's people. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Christ is alive today. He, by His death, put death to death. My friends, there's no, no need to be fearful of death. Many of you are fearful of death. Many of you are afraid of the day of, of your demise when your life will come to an end. But my friends, I don't fear death. My brother doesn't fear death out here because Jesus Christ saved us from our sins. Jesus Christ, we know, has promised to raise us up from the dead. To raise us up to life incorruptible, to eternal life, to eternal pleasures in the presence of God and of the holy angels forever. You say, how do you have such confidence? Because God has said it to be true. God is true, and in Him there is no lie. In Him there is no deceit. In fact, we know in the, the book of James, for example, the Bible says that it is impossible. It is an impossibility for God to lie. So we can have the supreme, the utmost confidence in His promises that they will come to pass. That they will come to pass. I'll give you an example of this. Is in Romans. It's in the book of Romans when Paul is talking about Abraham. In Romans 4, verse 3, he says, For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. The Apostle Paul here says that salvation is merely, a fa is merely a matter of believing the promises of God, taking God at His Word, believing that Jesus Christ is the Savior of humanity, that He is the seed of the woman who is coming to crush the head of the serpent, that He is the King of glory who is spoken of in the Psalms. He is the suffering servant who is spoken of in the book of Isaiah. He is the Lord our righteousness, as that Jeremiah prophesied. He is the greater son of David. It's taking those things and believing them. And Paul holds up Abraham as an example of that because Abraham took God at his word and God gave Abraham a righteousness that was not his own. See, my friends, you need a righteousness that is not your own. You need a righteousness that is outside of you, that is alien to you. Your righteousness on the day of judgment will not cut it. God's standard of, of, of righteousness is a perfect standard. It is so high. The bar is set so high, my friends. You need the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You need the righteousness of Jesus Christ. See, Jesus' own life, not just His death, His burial, and His resurrection had significance, but even His life, His 30 years of life on earth, as He lived, as He fulfilled the law of God, He told, the, he told John the Baptist, He said, that it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus Christ said, I did not come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law of God. So that when you and I turn from our sin, and we look to Him in saving faith, and we thrust ourselves upon the Lord of glory, that righteousness is imputed to us. That word impute means that it is credited to us. It is given to us as a gift. And God sees us. God sees us as righteous. God sees us clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. My friends, you need to be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ if you were to stand before God on the day of judgment. And it's freely offered to you, freely of grace. As the Apostle said, for by grace have we been saved through faith. And that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. It is the gift of God. My friends, God is in the business of giving people gifts, people who don't deserve them. You know, many of you are parents and you have children. You've given your children gifts. Did they deserve them? Did they work for them? Did they earn them? No. So likewise is God. He gives sinners gifts that they don't deserve. He gives them gifts that they don't deserve. You and I don't deserve it. In fact, we deserve the opposite. We deserve wrath and judgment. Because all throughout the Old Testament and the New, we find that God is not a God who overlooks sin as, an un as a corrupt judge would. God isn't a God who, who, who turns a blind eye to the wicked deeds performed by men as, as, as a corrupt earthly judge might. Rather, God takes into account every idle thought, every idle word you've spoken, every ill intent that you've had, 
Every wicked thing that you've done, God has a record of. When you delete your search history after watching pornography, God has a record of that. God knows that. And you'll be held accountable by God one day for that. If you do not repent, if you do not come. Many of you think that the warnings in the Bible are, 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 are posed in such a way so as to seem that God is putting them and giving them to us in a in a rude manner or in a in a in a angry manner rather no it's in grace god's inviting the wicked as isaiah 1 says come let him turn let him be healed god will have compassion on the wicked if they will turn if they will turn from their sins listen to what the prophet nahum says in nahum chapter 1 in verse 2 he says, Je a jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on His adversaries and He reserves wrath for His enemies. However, look at this in verse 3. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In whirlwind, is, in storm is His way and clouds are the dust beneath His feet. That's incredible. We look, up, we look up above us and we see the clouds. And we see their splendor and their majesty and their grandeur. And how large they are. And how wonderfully beautiful they are. And the Bible says those are merely dust particles beneath God's feet. They're nothing to Him. Things that are so great are nothing to Him. He says in verse 4, He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Fashion and karma wither. The, bliz the, the blossoms of Lebanon wither. Mountains quake because of him. And the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by his presence. The world and all the inhabitants in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the burning of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. And the rocks are broken up by him. The Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows those who take refuge in him. But with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of its sight. And he will pursue his enemies into darkness. What do we see here in Nahum 1? We see the characteristics and the attributes of God brought to our attention. Many of you think and unfortunately believe in a God that is merely a figment of your own imagination. A God that suits your own desires. A God that is an idol. You think, oh, my God is love and my God is gracious. But He's not holy. He's not just. He's not wrathful. But see, Nahum brings to our attention here that God is gracious. God is good. God is merciful. But He is also holy and just and righteous. And He will not. He will not let the guilty go unpunished. So that's the dichotomy. That, or that, that's what we could say is a dilemma. Because we find in the Bible, it says God is holy and will not let sin go unpunished. But then he says he forgives sinners. So how can that be? How can God forgive people of their sin, yet say, I will not forgive them of their sin? And this great dilemma is resolved in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, where the Son of God was crushed in the place of sinners. Where the Lord of glory was crushed in the place of the wicked. See, my friends, if, I, if I'm going down the street and I get, a, I get a speeding ticket, I have to pay that. That's the, that's the just penalty for breaking the law. But someone, a family member, a friend, could step in and they could pay for the ticket in my room, in my stead, in my place for me. And the justice of the law would be appeased. But they would be bearing the punishment. So likewise is it with Christ Though you and I deserve to pay the penalty for our sin, which we never could do, and so we are condemned to an eternal torment in hell, the eternal God, the infinite Lord of glory, takes upon Himself the lowly form of a servant and is despised and is forsaken of men and is spat upon and is hated and is rejected and bears upon His own self the wrath of God and cries out, Tetelestai, one word, translated, it is finished so that sinners could be free, so that sinners could have forgiveness. God bless you, sir. Do you have a question? Hey, God bless you too, brother. How are you doing today? I'm very good. How are you? I'm well, man. I'm well. I love the Lord as you do, brother. Is this, is this the most effective medium that you can find to 
this? Well, yes. Well, in terms of the community here, there's a lot of people coming in and out of this gas station here, and a lot of them pumping their gas, and they have nowhere else to go. A lot of them don't have anything to do for those couple of minutes. And uh, so we stand out here. We want to preach the gospel to them, share the gospel. i got a friend of mine out here, one of the guys at our church. He's uh, handing out gospel tracts, so that's another effective means. I'm, I'm one of the pastors at Poplar Springs Baptist Church, just a few miles down the road here. Well, sure, I, I'm not against those things. It's not like I'm out here saying this is the only way to do it. This is just one of the many ways. You know, Jesus just said, preach the gospel, proclaim the gospel. And it can be done in so many ways. In fact, I, um, I, I would love to even have a conversation with people. I mean, that's, a, that's an effective way to share the gospel as well. I'm not against that. But this is an effective way in terms of reaching a lot of people at the same time. And we, we even have people stop in their car at the red light. They let down their windows. They're listening to music. They might turn it down for a minute and listen. So you'd be surprised how many people can be reached in just a few minutes uh, through the preaching of the gospel in the open air. God bless you, brother. God bless you. Can I give you a gospel track? Can I give you a gospel track, sir? Well, this has a lot of Bible Bible verses that would instruct you. It, it's really good. Yeah, God bless you, sir. What's your name? I'm Brendan McNamara. You are? I'm Lucas Mann. It's a pleasure to meet you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Have a blessed day, sir. Dear friends, as I was just mentioning to my friend here, um, we, we come out here because we do want to reach you with the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We find that this is an effective way to do it. Many of you are about your daily activities and you have a moment. And so we want to share with you that Christ Jesus is the Lord. He is the Lord. He is Lord of your life. You say, well, I don't believe in Him. See, I don't confess that Jesus is Lord. God bless you, sir. I don't confess that, uh, that He is Lord over my life. But my friends, I'll tell you, whether you believe it or not, He's Lord. I mean, you could, you could deny the fact that uh, Donald Trump is the president, but it's still a fact. You could deny that uh, America is a country, but it's still a fact. So it is with Christ, my friends. Jesus Christ is Lord, whether you confess and believe it or not. What you must do is recognize that Lordship, that Lordship of Christ, and submit, bow the knee to our King. See, kingdoms come and go. Countries rise and they fall. Presidents come and go. The economy goes up and down. Your life is here for a moment and it's gone, but Jesus Christ remains King. Jesus Christ remains Lord. We want you to know that He is graciously offering to make you one of His slaves, to make you one of His servants. Paul the Apostle, one of the, the, the men most mightily used of God in the Scriptures, one of the men most mightily used of God in all of the, the history of the church said in, in Romans 1, I am the bond servant of Christ. I am the doulos. I am the slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, my friends, today either you are a slave to sin, either you are a slave to sin, or you are a slave of the Son of God. God bless you, brother. It's good to see you. Thank you <laughs> so you much. Too. How you doing? All right. How about you? Good, good. You just yeah. driving by? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, <laughs> praise the Lord. Saw, I saw a knucklehead over you. <laughs> that one right there. That's right. That's right. <laughs> praise the Lord. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate that greatly. Okay. Your body's... A lot of people. Yeah, a lot of people. It's so busy at this time of the day. Yeah. In fact, I just had a gentleman right before you came come up and speak with you and speak with me. So I was able to give him a gospel tract and that's what Mike's over there handing out is tracts as people are coming by. So, yeah, praise the Lord, brother. It's exciting. I, I, it's just amazing. Oh, so many people. You know, it's a small town, but man, people come in and out. Yeah, yeah. They really, they really do. Post office is usually a busy place, and you catch them coming out of there right here. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I love it when people pump, pump their gas because we call that a captive audience. <laughs> they, they have nowhere to go. They can't move. They're stuck. So they might be convicted, and they're sticking their head down, you know. <laughs> so, well, thank you so much. Lord bless you. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Uh, that was one of the members of our church, my friends. And you know, you know what's so beautiful about the church is that Jesus said, I will build my church. See, we come out here knowing and trusting our Lord that He will call those whom He wills to Himself. Perhaps you are one of those whom He will call. Perhaps you're one of His sheep whom He will call into His eternal kingdom to be a part of His church, to be a part of His body. He promises to build that and to expand that. He promises to use the preached Word, to use the preaching of the Gospel to do that. 
And so we offer the invitation. Because as Nahum says, our Lord is slow to anger and great in power. But He will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. You're guilty. You're guilty, my friends. Guilty is charged. And God will hold you accountable. God will hold you accountable for your sins. God will hold you accountable for those wicked thoughts that you think, my friends. You need to be cleansed by Christ's power, by Christ's gospel. Paul the Apostle said, he said in Romans chapter 1, he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. The Greek word there is dunamis. That's where we get the word dynamite from. It's a life-changing, powerful gospel. It is the only true gospel. It's the only message, the only religious message that will save and change lives. There have been religious leaders throughout all the ages that have, that have risen and have fallen. There have been churches that have come and have gone. There have been people who have said, I am the way, and then they die off and their movement, their movement with them. But our Lord Jesus Christ came and He established His church. He established His people and here we are today. The number so great, so hard to estimate, and that fulfills the promise God gave to Abraham all the way back in Genesis that He would give him descendants as numerous as the sand upon the seashore. Our God is a faithful God. He fulfills His promises. Our Lord Jesus is a gracious King. He is a gracious King, my friends. We don't come out here... Thank you. God bless you. We don't come out here inviting you to come to Christ hoping that He'll accept you, hoping that He'll save you. We know that He will accept you. We know that He will save you from your sins, both young and old, rich and poor. He will save you from your sins, my friends. So praise the Lord God with us. Praise God for His grace in Jesus Christ. Give God the glory for the great things that He has done. God has done such mighty things, such wonderful things in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And what an offense, what an affront, what a disrespect and a dishonor toward God that we would even conceive of rejecting that we would even come contemplate running from such a, such a Redeemer, such a High Priest as Jesus Christ is. You know, the Bible says He is seated at the right hand of God in heaven right now. That He lives to make intercession for all of God's people. That He is the mediator. There's no mediator besides Jesus Christ. Not the Pope, no pastor, no priest, no religious system, no, no church. Only Christ, my friends. Only Christ can mediate between you and God and do it effectively and do it perfectly and save you from your sins to the uttermost. Our cry, our, 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 our invitation to you, our plea for you this afternoon is that as you're going about your daily activities, as you're going about the, 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 the events of your life, engaging perhaps even in your work, we want you to think about your life. Think about eternity. Think about the existence of your life. Think about the fact that your life does not end when you die. You continue to live on. Your soul continues. In fact, we all have this stamped upon us. The Bible says that we have in eternity engraved in us, as it were. We have a sense that, that after this, after this life, it's not over. After this life, it's not all done with. And that's why throughout the whole history of the human race, we find religious systems all around the world. Because people have this sense that my life does not end when I die. I continue to live on. And they even have a sense, even those who've never heard of the Bible or ever heard of Jesus have a sense that I know that I'm going to live on after I die and I have sin. I have, I have law breaking. I have, I have a tendency to be unholy and impure. And I'm fearful of death. I'm fearful of the fact that I'm going to stand before God with this sin, with this unrighteousness on me. And only the Christian gospel addresses that dilemma. Only Jesus Christ can save you from that. Because if you are His, He already paid for that sin. He already paid for that iniquity. And there is no longer a debt to be paid. There is no longer 
any more debt before God. Christ has utterly, fully paid for it so that you and I could enjoy, if you were His, so that you and I could enjoy eternal salvation to the glory of God. Praise the Lord for such grace. Praise the Lord as the psalmist says. And Psalm 148 says, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in, in the heights. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all stars of light. Praise Him, highest heavens and the waters that are above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded and they were created. He has also established them forever and ever. He has made a decree which will not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth. Sea monsters in all deeps, fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy wind, fulfilling His word, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and winged fowl, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and virgins, but old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord, for His name alone is exalted. His glory is above the earth and heaven, and He has lifted up a horn for His people. Praise for all His godly ones, even the sons of Israel, a people near to Him. Praise Yahweh. Indeed, my friends, Join us today in praising God for His grace in Jesus Christ. Give God the glory by coming, by turning, by rejecting the sin that you've once lived in. Rejecting your own self, rejecting your selfish desires, denying yourself, dying to yourself, and coming to the Redeemer to be His servant. And He promises not to reject you. He promises not to reject those who come to Him. My friends, I want to remind you, my name is Lucas Mann, and I'm one of the pastors of Poplar Springs Baptist Church here in Ware Shoals, about three or four miles down the road, right outside of town. My friends, we invite you to come to our church to worship with us, to praise God with us, to learn more of the things that I've spoken about here today. We care for you, we love you, we, we've been praying for you, we continue to pray for you. I don't come out here because I hate you. If I hated you, I'd just stay at home. If I hated you, I would just stay at home. I'd sleep in. I would be doing other things. I'd go spend time with my family. But my friends, because I love you, I'm bound to be out here because I know that you'll stand before God. And if you're not right with God, if you're not in Jesus Christ, you'll stand before God and it will be a fearful thing. So dear friends, oh dear friends, and I say that because I do love you. You think you're filthy. You think you're disgusting. You think your sin is great, and it is. My sin is great before God. But don't, do not despair. There is a Savior. And He saves, as the Bible uses the term, to the uttermost. That is, completely, perfectly. Even Paul told the Philippians that he knew the God, the God who had started the work of salvation in their life would perfect it. He would bring it to an end. He would complete it. And my friends, I tell you, I tell you with all the confidence in the world that God will save you if you call upon Him. Joel 2, as well as Acts 2 say, Forever who, for whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Call upon Him today. Do not delay. Cry out. Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And He will hear that prayer. So give God the glory, my friends. Again, I'm Lucas Mann. I pastor Poplar Springs Baptist Church. We're here representing our local church. And we stand here today for the truth. To proclaim the truth so that you might partake of belief in the truth. That you might be changed by the truth. And that you might come to the one who is the truth. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So glorify Him, my friends. Glorify Him today. Give Christ Jesus glory, praise, and honor, and majesty. He is worthy. Christ Jesus is worthy of all worship. 
He is worthy of all adoration because of what He has done. So may He be glorified. May Jesus, may Yeshua HaMashiach, may the Messiah, may the Savior of all mankind, especially of believers, be glorified both now and forevermore. Amen.